Hi, my name is Tashawn Card. I'm a policy analyst on the higher education team here at New America. Two cases currently sit with SCOTUS, Student for Fair Admissions versus Harvard College and Student for Fair Admissions versus the University of North Carolina, which could likely ban colleges and universities from considering race in their admissions process. If SCOTUS decides to overturn affirmative action, we can expect to see many damaging and rippling effects throughout the higher education system and other public institutions. Here at New America, we acknowledge that we are not experts on affirmative action. However, we are dedicated to making higher education more equitable and accountable for those uh, fighting for inclusion rather than exclusion so that everyone can obtain an affordable, high quality education. Therefore, we are very committed to using our platform to uplift those with deep expertise and knowledge to raise awareness and speak and uh, spark cohesive dialogue on creating future policies to ensure that higher education institutions are a guiding light in embracing diversity, equity, and inclusion. I want to introduce Dr. Oyan Poon, who is a visiting scholar at the University of Maryland at College Park. She has done a lot of research and amazing work um, around race and higher education. Don't want to speak too much because I want to give her the floor to talk about um, her work and why she's interested in being in this particular policy space. Thank you, Deshaun. Um, hi, everyone. I'm uh, Oyan Poon, as Deshaun mentioned, and I have um, long been doing work on the racial politics of college admissions and also how college admissions and enrollment management work because um, very few people actually know how things work. And so I, I'm concerned quite a bit about the public discourse and how we talk about college going and college access because it's hard to have those conversations in a serious way when most people don't understand how these systems and structures work um, to produce um, inequalities by race, ethnicity, class, gender, um, and many other dimensions. Um, I have gotten the question quite a bit sometimes about why I do the work I do and um, in, in the research and analysis that I do. And um, there's two areas of my work um, that are informed by my, my previous life as a student affairs professional in higher education and someone who worked on college recruitment and retention work in California um, after Proposition 209, which was that state ban that was uh, voted on in 1996 and went into place in 1998. I was um, working with particularly Asian American and Pacific Islander students at the University of California at Davis in the early 2000s. So this was after the state affirmative action ban there. Um, and what I noticed was um, deep inequalities between who was attending college among a very diverse Asian American and Pacific Islander population. Almost no Pacific Islanders um, were in attendance. Southeast Asian Americans um, had very low numbers after the affirmative action ban. And also low income Asian Americans were not very well represented. Um, yet the university and in general, I think people don't quite understand how to talk about these very diverse populations and make meaning and sense of it. And so um, I um, was very interested in these questions. I was also an admissions reader post Proposition 209 in California at the university and um, learned a lot about the how admissions works um, and doesn't work, right? Um, prior to that work, I didn't realize uh, the complexities and the thoughtfulness and the norms that are put in place and how to do that work. Oftentimes people simplify, oversimplify and flatten um, how this work is done. Um, and again, that goes back to how we talk about these issues is very malnourished, <laughs> I'll say. Um, and um, yeah, and so I, I'm very interested in noting, especially as someone who grew up in the 80s in Boston, the daughter of immigrants, working class immigrants, um, my family of Chinese Americans were very much like, yeah, affirmative action, it's, it's an anti-racist policy. Of course, we're supportive of it. But, you know, more recently, we've seen a lot of media reports of Chinese Americans and other Asian Americans. Um, it, there's this image of people 
um, that I identify with being opposed to this policy. And it didn't make sense. It didn't track with my experiences growing up. And so um, I'm known for doing, a doing research on why are Asian Americans feeling the different ways they do about race conscious admissions and affirmative action policies. I've also done work on contracting because quite frankly, the history of affirmative action is not in college admissions. It is in employment and public contracting. And I have done research on public contracting in Asian American small businesses. And it was very difficult to find any Asian American opposed to affirmative action in that space, um, right? And so these things don't track for me. And so what I have found over time is that the folks that keep popping up in mainstream media as Asians opposed to affirmative action, quote unquote, it's a very small number among Asian Americans. So there's this mythology out there that people like me are opposed to affirmative action. And that's absolutely not the case. Um, but also there's a fear, right? Just to kind of like empathize with the people who are, you know, fighting tooth and nail against race conscious admissions. Um, what I found in my research is that there's a fear in not knowing what exactly is happening. And so that's the second strand of my research is how exactly does admissions work? Um, in, in colleges and universities. Um, and so that's that's a very power-laden process, but I've never once found that, um, that there is an anti-Asian motive to this work um, at all, um, particularly given the history of various court cases leading up to this moment we're in. Thank you for sharing. I was like, all the points you hit, I was like, wow. I was like, when you talked about Davis, I was like, hold on, that's my undergrad. Um, Is it really? water. I was like, yes. I was like, and I also was at one point a admissions reader too. So I was like on that other side reading. Right? Yeah. And I'm like, it's so interesting to like see all the components that go in. Were you in the SSR, SRRC? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Ace, the, I don't know if, I don't know yes. if Ace was around that yes. time. But I was a volunteer, like all those, like those, those core programs mm -hmm. is probably the reason I'm able to talk to you today, like being actually in front of you to talk about these issues yeah. because of how important it is to have those resources on campus. Um, and also, like you said earlier too, about affirmative action, it wasn't the start of education. It goes back to employment. Um, and I think I kind of want to get into a little bit more about that definition a little bit more with you. Um, so yeah, Washington Post Shar School, they recently, you know, surveyed the general public about their views on race um, being considered in the missions process. And in that poll, about 70% disapproved of race being considered in the college admission process, but 70% appreciated programs that helped increase diversity on college campuses. So I'm just like, what is the disconnect between the general public and basically the definition of, of affirmative action? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think this is a perfect example of, um, when you're, you're talking to a researcher, so I'm going to say research design, survey design is a very important thing to think through and connecting it to um, what's actually happening, right? So I think the response is that this paradox, this conflict between people saying, no, we're not okay with race being considered versus 70% also saying, yeah, we support increasing diversity. Um, is a couple of things. One, first and foremost, it's how was the question asked? That matters a lot um, in survey methodology. And particularly around this work, I um, would like to lift up the work of my uh, political scientist colleagues um, at AAPI Data in particular. They've been doing work around polling um, Asian Americans in particular nationally in various languages because we know Asian Americans are a majority immigrant population. And so um, they use different languages, but they've tested out different questions, right? And interestingly, when you ask Asian Americans in that survey, do you support affirmative action, a policy that uplifts, I can't remember the exact wording, but it was basically that uplifts black and women applicants. Over 70% of Asian American respondents said yes, agree or strongly agree, right? And so it's really interesting to see this kind of dynamic in the survey question, 
Um, if the survey question here in this Washington Post Shar School poll had asked, like, how do you feel about race being considered? It's not clear about to what ends, right? The API data survey question said, do you approve of affirmative action? You know, what? how do you feel about affirmative action? Do you agree with a policy that combats sexism and, right? Like, so it's, it, it and anti-black racism, right? Like it's it's very um specific to what ends, right? Because we have, particularly when you're talking about people of color, you've got a long history of our racial identities being used against us, right? Um that's a different objective than for diversity. So I would wonder if these two questions were combined and asked in a way that is like how do you feel about, or do you approve of race being considered to increase diversity, right? So combine those two questions. I have a question of like, how would people respond, right? And perhaps survey methodologists, and I'm not one to be clear, um, would be like, well, that's mixing things. Fine, then do it the other way too. You know, try it out a different, a couple of different ways. And I think that's perfectly fine research wise. Um, but I think most of the polls that I've seen that don't think deeply about race and racial discourses, you can get into this kind of thing here. Yeah, thank you for sharing on that because I was like, we need to have more dialogue around what the actual definition mean and you know the, the importance of increasing diversity when it comes to college admissions. Like I think people are convoluting things um and what does diversity mean yeah, what is yeah diversity? like what is yeah what is diversity like what what does that mean and that means that can mean very different to a lot of different people so right. it's you have to be very specific and also get right to the point and like you said about survey methodology um especially when you're surveying certain communities you have to be mindful of who you're going to be with the language so yeah uh uplifting that point that you said um, want to shift gears because um, you probably have seen in the news with certain states um, thinking about Florida and Texas um, about their DEI efforts. Are their actions a precursor to what we might see unfold um, nationwide if affirmative action is overturned? And what is at stake for higher education institutions and their current DEI efforts? So to your first question, um, are these anti-DEI efforts a precursor to what we're gonna see post Supreme Court ruling in these SFFA cases? I hope not. It doesn't have to be, to be clear. However, I also know that the same people who are, and this goes back to the previous question about misunderstandings of what is it that the public actually wants, right? Because I don't, I think SFFA, it was led by Ed Blum, not an Asian person, a white man who has been trying to gut civil rights laws throughout his entire life, including the voting rights law, including he's been trying to attack immigrant voting rights. Um, and now this is his next piece. He recognizes that people don't understand admissions. He recognizes people don't understand how to talk about Asian Americans and race. And he recognizes that people generally don't like the Harvards of the world. Let's be real, right? Like Harvard is an elitist name. Um, and so with those three things in mind, he was very strategic in attacking Harvard. Um, and he was supported by the same people who are pushing for these anti-DEI things. Which is why when he files every one of these SFFA lawsuits, you will find a line towards the end of the legal complaints that says what they're after. They're not going to get it in this SFFA rulings, the rulings this time around, um, I don't think. However, they make very clear what they want in their long game, which is the end of the use of race in all educational settings. That should sound very familiar and pretty much what we're seeing in Florida, Texas, Oklahoma, and other states. Um, with book banning, et cetera, they wanna keep people ignorant. They wanna keep people ignorant um, and fearful 
right? Rather than allowing people to come together um, and unify for a better society, right? A more mutually diverse collective solidarity, like what Heather McGee has talked about for a solidarity dividend. As long as we stay afraid and apart and separate and in conflict with each other, then out of ignorance, then the powerful remain in control, right? Um, so is it a precursor? We know it comes from the same rotten soil, both of these things, these lawsuits against these universities for wanting to consider my whole story. What does it mean for me? How has racism, not necessarily my identity, racism, how has racism affected my experiences and who I am today, right? And that can be many different ways for a lot of different people. And yes, in fact, racism does affect white people too, right? <laughs> like it's it's a thing in the water, in the air, in the everything we do, um, racism. And so to tell universities, you can't even think about this and who you decide to bring in, you can, it becomes dehumanizing to people and our stories and who we are. Um, if that played a big role in who we are, right? And that's part of how it works. It's not a checkbox, right? Um, in admissions or employment or contracting, it's not a checkbox. Um, and saying like, here's extra points, you get extra awarded. Um, but that's not how it works at all. Um, it is understanding, Deshaun, who are you as a person? What do you bring, right? Sometimes I'll say, you know, um, 1100. What do you know about me from that number? You know nothing about me from that number, right? You don't know the kinds of talents I bring. And that's what a de multiracial democracy needs is all kinds of talents for solving all kinds of problems. And that's what race conscious admissions has been doing to this point. And so I think there are more people who are suspicious of anti DEI work. I think, I hope, I don't know. But you can't be against those anti-DEI things and against affirmative action at the same time. That's That doesn't work. Um, but what I really want to say is, is this a precursor was your initial question? It doesn't have to be if we can come together and like get clear on what our values are, regardless of what the Supreme Court rules in this coming month, our values can still stay the same. Our values, the, the court cannot change what I value, period, right? And so um, as a higher ed researcher, as a thinker, as a citizen of a multiracial democracy, I care about learning about the complicated world around us, solving problems together, right? And so is ending DEI efforts at stake in higher education? Yes. It doesn't have to be, but it is at stake, um, sadly. And I think people need to be courageous in leading our institutions and our states to say, yeah, racism is a problem and we need to learn, we need to figure out how to solve these big problems and shutting down that learning is not how we do it. You can't solve cancer, you can't cure cancer by pretending it's not a thing by telling people you can't learn about it. Like that makes zero sense to me. No, you're right. You're right. <laughs> We're all right. You're right to all that. Um, yeah, because like people want to sweep these issues under the rug. And when it comes to DI, that's like my whole thinking is like it's it's more than just emissions. Like we want to make sure that we bring people into the institutions who, for starters, mm -hmm. like as someone who identifies as a woman of color, as a black woman, when it comes to like having access to health care and, you know, you want someone that looks like you at these institutions, or you want a doctor that represents you or has, you know, cultural, linguistic, you know, the same identity as you. And I think people are not understanding that bigger picture of what this is going to look like. And then also going back to the DEI efforts on campus, it's like, you're focused on getting the students there, but then when they get there, they need those resources to keep them there and achieve that success. Mm -hmm. 
And that's kind of like the, the bigger picture of these DI efforts. I'm like, y'all focus on getting them in, but then the institution wants to also not take care of them when they get there. Mm -hmm. So that's a whole nother mantra that I could probably go down the road with you all day too, mm -hmm. um, is about that. Um, so thank you for sharing. And thinking I kind of want to get into the, the policy side of this, because I, like you mentioned earlier, you know, California has already banned affirmative action and Michigan, but both of them have already, you know, have mentioned, they even submitted amicus briefs too, by saying like, yeah, this is not working for us. Um, and we're seeing a lot of decrease in enrollment, you know, from black, brown, uh, students of color at all of, at our public university and our selective institutions. Um, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on maybe what we can actually learn from these states and what should federal policymakers know? And are there any California or Michigan policy that you might be aware of that could be replicable for federal for the federal policy arena um, to just ensure diversity is embraced and valued appropriately? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think there's a lot we can learn from those two states in terms of what and what can be done after a ban, um, what that means. Um, I think both states, and, and there's I think there's eight states total um, that have bans on their books. Um, California and Michigan get talked about a lot because, um, because they're California and Michigan and they have very, um, you know, attention grabbing public universities, flagship universities. That said, um, I, they still collect a lot of data. Right, California, as an example, has probably more detailed data collection than um, than the federal government requires. Right, and as someone who was an admissions reader and worked on retention issues at UC Davis in California under a ban, the data was still asked for in the admissions. Uh, applications, it was optional, as are these, these demographic questions are always optional. Um, students want to say who they are, let them say who they are. Um, as an admissions reader, I didn't see, who, you know, that box. But in what students talked about, they talked about their experiences, and quite frankly, oftentimes it was racialized experiences. Um, sometimes it wasn't, right? Like, it just wasn't, a part of their stories and that's fine. It doesn't, you don't get penalized one way or the other, right? Um, and I think it was important to understand these students and who they were, right? As an example, Sally Chen, Chinese American woman from San Francisco went to Harvard, testified in the SFFA case for the side of Harvard for diversity. And she said, you know, her high school counselor told her not to talk about her identity, not to check off a box. But what she found out was because her leadership and her engagement in her community and her accomplishments had so much to do with being engaged in her community as a Chinese American woman, um, the Harvard Admissions Committee looked on that favorably, right? And so in her, you know, and, and there were other Asian students who testified to that as well. You couldn't fully understand who Sally was without that um, information. So she went against what some people told her to do. Um, and as a reader at UC Davis, I think I would have done the same, like, oh, okay, this is, this person's story is about community engagement, um, leadership, et cetera, right? And there's a, first and foremost, academically solid, right? <laughs> like period. Um, she wasn't getting in because of her story. She was getting in because of her academic profile first and foremost. And then the other pieces were just kind of fleshing out who she was, giving us a bigger detailed picture. So I think that I'm hearing right now, some universities are saying, oh, or, or Common App, for example, just announced today that they were giving universities the option not to receive the demographic data. Um, and I think that's a mistake. I think that's a huge mistake um, for a couple of reasons. Because the other piece is what places like California continue to do is, in my work as a retention person, I was constantly looking at the data in terms of progress towards degree, right? And the state of California had accountability measures in place for time to college degree completion, right? So they were holding universities accountable. 
But if I don't know what's happening on my campus in terms of where are the bumps and dips and how do I invest my public tax dollar resources into serving the students I have on campus, if I don't have race and ethnicity data, class data, language spoken at home data, you know, more data is more helpful, to be honest. And so to figure out then, how do I invest my dollars towards, towards supporting different students' needs and different students' interests? Perfect example, um, 20 years ago when I was at UC Davis, there was no Asian American, um, there was like one or two Asian American counselors in the counseling and uh, CAPS, counseling and something services. <laughs> Um, right out of like a staff of like 30 or 40. And that campus at the time was 40%, almost 40% Asian American. Um, and almost no Asian Americans were attending, going to utilize those services. And in the three years I was there, there were several student suicides of, um, or suicide uh, attempts as well among Asian American students. And the police were targeting Southeast Asian men. And right, like there's just all these traumas that were not getting served, right? And so students were like, hey, this is not okay. Also, there's no one on campus in student affairs that identifies as working with American Indian and native needs. Also, right, like um, all these things, right? And so how do you serve the students on your campus if you don't know who's there? And you don't know who's there and what their needs are right? Um, they've already proven themselves academically qualified, um, right? And so what do you do? How do you do this, right? Um, how do you spend my, our, our, our public tax dollars to support the students on our campus? Um, I'm scared that there are institutions that think that they can't even have those data anymore. Um, and that's not true. And learning from Michigan and California, you can't. You absolutely can, and you need to. And I think you have a moral obligation to do so. Um, the other thing that I noticed in California was, and we talked about this earlier, right, Deshaun, is the Student Recruitment and Retention Center, SRRC. The history of, you know, post Proposition 209, post affirmative action ban in California, students came together, created a movement and said, we still care about this. So we're going to tax ourselves. They, they voted on fees to say we need to fund student efforts supported by professional staff um, to do outreach and recruitment and the and the peer-to-peer -peer retention work on campus, right? And so you mentioned um, ACE, right? Um, I worked a lot with SAFE, which was the Southeast Asian um, Southeast Asians for Education, and I'm blanking on the other one. It's been a long time, Deshaun. What were the other ones? It, I was going to say it's been a long time for me, too. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I know there was one um, for the Chilak community, too, but I can't, I cannot think of it. And I had a friend who worked, who worked directly. Uh, it's, I should know this because I spent majority of my undergrad career at the SRC. Um, and then now things have expanded on that particular campus too, because now like a lot of communities have their own resource center. Mm -hmm. um, my last year in undergrad, uh, you know, the black community got a resource center. Then other communities started to get their own because we all were like, hey, we need more than just the SRC. We need other things too. So um, I love yeah. this intergenerational connection here. <laughs> I was it's the first student affairs officer in Asian American studies. And, and we came on board um, along with the Native American studies SAO. And there was an African American studies SAO and a Chicano studies SAO, um, you know, and, um, you know, and then I went back to grad school at UCLA and they have a whole build, they had a whole building before Davis had a whole building. Um, but these were all student movement activist led efforts that we're really targeting racial equity, right? So these are things that happened after affirmative action bans. And I think folks need to not freak out and remember that these are possible. 
UC Davis Medical School, I think just got cited as one of the med schools with the most black students outside of an HBCU. And it's, it's rather comparable in terms of the numbers. And I'm like, something's happening, right? In really good ways to recognize talent, to recognize talent, right? Before anyone out there who's mm -hmm. friends with Ed Bloom is gonna say like, oh, they're lowering standards, no. No, absolutely not. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. And like I said, I have a little bit of hope um, about, you know, how institutions can move forward if uh, looking at some of what California and Michigan have done. And again, like the data piece, so, so important. Um, as someone who used to work in evaluation and whole and loves data and how important it is. Uh, I hope and continue that universities and institutions can have act like create some type of mechanism or structures to input that in place. And I'm still mind, bog mind boggled by what Common App just recently released. I'm gonna have to look into that later because I'm like, wait a minute, that's that's not okay. I don't see it on their website, but someone just shared this New York Times article with me. Mm -hmm. so share that with you. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Um, yeah. Now moving into a little bit more of, I know we were talking about some hope, so we kind of are, we were talking about a little bit of hope and, you know, some, hopefully what's unfolding after, most likely is going to be, I mean, of course, it's going to be June 30th when we hear the final, when we hear the decision, mm -hmm. but what would you like the general public just to take away from what is unfolding? You know, what is one hope? And what is something you actually fear about the upcoming decision? <sighs> this is existential questions right here, Deshaun. <laughs> like, um, um, you know, this is going to sound real cheesy, but my daughter is eight years old and she's in sec, she's finishing up second grade this month. And I, and I feel like here's the typical Gen Xer saying the future generations are the hope after we have ruined everything, as my daughter tells me. Um, right. But truly, I am constantly inspired and hopeful that, you know, the folks who are younger than me, that we can work together cross generationally. Um, because there's so much brilliance, right? Like my like the fact that my daughter is asking me questions starting when she was three. I don't know how other parents do this and why they're trying to do this anti-DEI stuff in schools or anti like doing book bans. Um, I don't know how they deal with the questions there. They, I know they're getting questions as a parent, kids, kids ask questions. That's their job. Right. Um, and sorry about that ping. I thought I turned it off. Um, but, um, kids ask questions, right. And the, some of the questions my kids started asking me when she was three was if we're not black and we're not white, what are we wait? You're telling me we're Asian American. That's not a color. So help me understand that. Right. She was three. I mean, those weren't exactly the words. She couldn't even say Asian American. She said Asian American. Um, and she was like, oh, we're Thai and Chinese. That's also not a color. <laughs> and I'm like, Ah, how do I help you understand at three years old color and race and racism and xenophobia and all these other things in this world that you're going to have to deal with? Um, I think young people asking questions and pushing those questions and figuring out and learning intergenerationally on how to push back, like what it means to actually do something material around it. Um, you know, I'm I'm seeing like for another example, you know, the, the March for Our Lives group, right? Those young people are elevating. I mean, we have a long ways to go around gun safety, but they're changing around along with like moms for, you know, gun control, those groups, like they're changing the way we talk about it. We don't talk about gun control. We talk about gun safety now, which I don't know, um, but, you know, it's advancing the dialogue and post you know, George Floyd and the BLM movement, like, I think these are important things that we need to keep moving on and keep iterating on. And so I still feel hopeful there, even 
even assuming that the Supreme Court is going to rule in a way that further restricts understanding us as people, as whole human beings, um, and recognize, you know, I, I still hold a hope that in ashes, we can still rise, right? Like when things get burned down, it can still be, fire can still be generative. Um, and so we have to figure out the generative piece. Um, the fear is that we just fall apart. <laughs> like that just, it, it's just, um, but we can't have nine people decide the fate of this country, right? Like decide it just, but that's my fear, right? Is that we're just going to fall apart and cry in a corner forever. Um, but that's not what we do as people, right? Um, as long as our communities are, are, are connected enough and we can keep building on it, I think that at a certain point you finish crying and you figure it out and you come together. And that's my hope too, is that in, in that burning down of stuff, we can figure out something to be more powerful. Because at the end of the day, you know, this week was also the Thomas Jefferson lawsuit in the Fourth Circuit. On the one hand, in higher education, you know, SFFA is saying race conscious is unconstitutional. Their friends at Pacific Legal Foundation are saying race neutral things are not okay either. So then what is it, right? And we keep playing. If we keep, this is my fear, is that we try to keep playing in response, right? That we start, we keep trying to transform starting at this point when really the game is rigged and we're not, we need to, we need to just, my hope is that we'll figure this out finally collectively and say like, okay, let's think real gener like real big, real big. How do we go big? And, and how do we backwards plan that and get going on things? No, that's, that's good. Um, it was like, whoop, 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 whoop. We're, we're, we're gonna get there. We're, we're gonna get we're there. Gonna get there. We're, we're gonna get there. I mean, and you calling me was hope, right? I'm <laughs> like, oh, new America, you know, like you're worried now too. Okay. I was like, we're gonna get there some way, somehow. It's probably gonna take a while because the stuff that's built up has taken forever. So to tear it all down, it's going to take a while too, but we're, we're going to get there eventually. Uh, so thank you. Um, and my last question, um, because it's, we're, we're at New America, we're so federally policy focused um, and given our location, just being in Washington, DC. And, you know, what would you like Congress and the White House to know about the fallout in front of action is overturned? And yeah, what, what can Congress do to maintain and improve access for students of color? I think it's a, it's a funding issue, right? When you think about the ecosystem of higher education in this country, we don't really have a national system. Um, there's a few federal levers, right? You've got, you've got federal financial aid, Pell Grants, subsidized, unsubsidized loan systems. Um, forgiveness, which is also on the docket, um, <laughs> or cancellation rather than forgiveness, because I already paid my stuff, okay? Um, <laughs> I already paid it all back, and more than once, <laughs> so cancel it already. Um, but, right, so what are the other levers? Um, MSI funding, HBCU, TCU, MSI funding, right? Um, <clears throat> and uh, research dollars, Right. So I'm sure there's some other things, of course, but thinking about those things, right? We know that we know that the great majority of people who go to college don't go to colleges that need to reject people. Right. So a lot of this conversation with Harvard and UNC, you're talking about a very small slice of the college going population. And you're also talking about institutions that are very well resourced, very wealthy. A friend of mine, Marie Bigham, called them the Harvards of the world. Um, what did she call it? Oh my gosh, what's that? She called it a hedge fund. Those universities are hedge funds with 
country clubs attached. Um, so, right, like the funding inequalities, right? It is not, it, it, we need to tackle this problem of where the majority of students are going, and most of them are students of color, are going to institutions that are not well funded. Right. And so, how do we think about the finance model, the ecosystem of funding? How do we invest in HBCUs and tribal colleges and universities and other MSIs, minority serving institutions? Right. These are some of the institutions that are, you know, these are major institutions that serve a whole lot of students, right? The majority of students. Um, you know, on the, I know you asked about federal, but you know, I'm thinking back to the state level too. Some some states have put caps on out of state um, admissions and enrollment, like California. Um, so, but again, that goes back to the financing model, right? Because why were states accepting out of staters to their public flagships? because they needed some form of revenue if the state was to divest from them, right? So how do we, is there a federal lever to reconfigure, recalibrate what goes to higher education? Because, you know, in some states, a lot of states, the states fund prisons at a much higher level than they do public higher education. How about start there, right? Like, can we, is there a federal accountability, something or other to help out in this regard around the financing models? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. About the financing of how we fund our education systems and the school to prison pipeline is another something to be talked about. And it cross, yeah, be a cross-sector conversation mm -hmm. in the criminal justice conversation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's like everyone has, has siloed themselves into certain policy areas. In reality, they all intersect with each other at the end of the day. Right, because I um, bet you if you traced 50 states and funding on, in, in mm -hmm. public education and in, in prison systems, it's going like this. Right. I don't know if that means that. You know what I mean, right? Like um, mm -hmm. going down, mm -hmm. yep. funding going up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the K through 12 system, that's another probably another conversation for another day about how that's gonna impact the way how the K through 12 system operates. But again, um thank you. Thank you so much for, for sharing your thoughts, um, your knowledge and the amazing work you have been doing. Um, in this particular policy area, now I'm look now I'm like even now I'm even siloing you into this post this policy area. But just again, just want to say thank you so much on behalf of me and my team um, at New America. We appreciate you so much, um, and yeah, hope everyone tunes in and watches this conversation and take away something. Hopefully, take away a nice, good, hefty dinner um, because a lot of good points were were definitely brought up. Um, and thank you so much. Thank you. So excited to have this conversation with you. Thank you.